other counting problems work out differently. So here's a different kind of counting problem. Uh, how many traffic accidents are there where you live every month? Okay, and for Tennessee, the uh, Tennessee Department of Transportation provides the data. I think I've got that up, up right here. And you can get the data, for example, um, by county and then by day of the week, by time of day or by month. And we're gonna look at uh, crashes by month. Um, I think we have here for uh, 11 years of data. I think we'll check in a second. Um, in any case, we're gonna look at car crashes by month um, in Tennessee. And here's what that data looks like. So you can see here, we have uh, starting in 2010, going to 2020, so yeah, 11 years of data, and we have the number of crashes per month for each county. All right, now, um, there are 95 counties in this data set. We can check that quickly. And all of these 95 counties, I'm gonna pick one to look at. We're gonna look at Miggs County. Miggs County is in southeastern Tennessee, and as I have uh, this link here, it's the home county of a town called Cute, Tennessee, and Cute, Tennessee, is the home is a ghost town, All right? So you know that's a place you could visit uh, on vacation sometime if you want to see a ghost town. Uh, all right, so Miggs County. If we look at the crashes there by month, uh, here we go. So here are the again 2010, 2020 for each month are the number of crashes. Um, you can see here that the number of crashes is between um, nine and 18 per month, roughly. At least that's what we see so far. So something like 10 to 20 crashes per month. Okay, looks typical. Uh, now we only see, see 10 rows there out of 132. So to see all of them, let's look at a histogram. And there we go. So uh, here are the crashes in Miggs County over 11 years. Mostly are in this range, mostly 10 to 20 crashes per month. Uh, this month, there, there was a month with only five, maybe two months with only uh, six. And then one month had 35 crashes. That's definitely an outlier for Miggs County for this time period. Um, but there's the distribution. There's the histogram or of the observed counts. All right. So the question is, what's the relevant probability distribution? And it's not binomial because we're not counting successes in binomial experiments. But we can get it from the binomial from a couple of observations. Like this is why I picked this example to start with. So um, here are the two things to notice. Um, there are lots of times when cars encounter each other on the roads. So there are lots of encounters when accidents could occur. So the, so the number of trials is large. The end that goes here is big. Um, most encounters don't end up in an accident, fortunately. So the probability of success in this case is very small in each encounter, but the accidents occur at a roughly constant rate per month. Okay, so in this case, the constant rate is something like from the histogram I don't know, uh, 14, 15-ish, 15 13-ish. We'll check in a second. Um, but there's a roughly constant rate per month, a low probability for each encounter of an accident, and many encounters. Okay, so we can put all that together in the binomial PMF and see what happens. So we have a large number N of trials, a small chance P of success, and a roughly constant expected value of NP, which we're gonna call lambda. That is the one parameter here. So with this one parameter lambda, and notice that lambda is the kind of thing you would compute from, from a sample. You would compute the average number of uh, crashes per month. So lambda is accessible from data. The n and the p, uh, not so much. But um, with this constant lambda of successes per month, with the n and the p, uh, we then use the PMF for the binomial distribution directly. So the probability of having k successes in a month, we just plug in and compute. Okay, so we have the binomial coefficient here, n choose k, right? We have p to the k, but p is now lambda over n, right? We have 1 minus p to the n minus k, and p is again lambda over n. And now we just uh, put things together. So um, 1 minus lambda over n all to the n minus k, we separate in two pieces, all right? This last ingredient, 1 minus lambda over n to the minus k, lambda over n... Um, which is p is very small. So that's very close to one. And one to the power minus k is about one. Now k here is some sort of moderate value, right? N is very large, p is very small, but k is sort of a, you know, a moderate number of accents. So that thing is, is close to one. Um, one minus lambda over n to the n 
Here we need a fact from uh, I don't know precalculus or calculus that one minus lambda over n to the n when n is very large is very close to e to the minus lambda. So we make that substitution here, and then the remaining terms, which are now shown here, um, the n to the k on the bottom, and the n factorial over n minus k factorial, that combination is about one, because when you do the cancellation, you've got uh, k terms on top, k n's on the bottom, k is much smaller than n, so that fraction is close to one. That leaves lambda to the k over k factorial times e to the minus lambda. So when the dust settles, when you work through this and use these approximations, the probability of having k accidents per month is e to the minus lambda over lambda to the k, uh, e to the minus lambda times lambda to the k over k factorial. So that is the PMF for this distribution. And again, it's called the Poisson distribution with rate lambda. And again, the rate lambda is something you actually can compute from some data. So um, one parameter, that's it. That's the PMF. Okay, and it's usually denoted uh, plus lambda like that. Now, for this distribution, for, for this kind of random variable, the expected value and the variance happen to be equal, and they both equal the parameter lambda, the rate lambda. That's an essential um, property of the Poisson distribution that you have to keep in mind, and it's useful in some applications, and it also makes this distribution uh, inappropriate in some cases. But you have to remember that for the Poisson, the expected value, the mean, and the variance are exactly the same. Okay, and to work with Poisson distributions, uh, you can use the, the Poisson module from uh, SciPy. All right, so now that we have that at our disposal, let's use it to simulate some crashes and see where else it applies. All right, so in Miggs County, okay, so now you'll see why I picked this one county to start out with, Miggs County. It's not because of the uh, of cute Tennessee, that's just a bonus. Um, it's because the mean and the variance, again, computed from the, the data, are about the same, 13.7 versus 15.2, all right? So having checked that, um, how well does the corresponding uh, Poisson distribution uh, model crashes in this county? Well, let's see. So we're gonna add, um, we're gonna simulate using that, that Poisson distribution um, and then plot the results, okay? So Poisson RVS gives us um, a random sample from that distribution. And so we have the observed crashes, we already had that. And then let's see, oh, the fit is beautiful, it's great. So the, the Poisson fits very well um, and it simulates crashes in Miggs County wonderfully, right? We didn't get this 35 outlier down here, but we did pretty well. Now, this is a simulation. So each time you run this, you'll get different results. So if I run it again, you know, it might be worse or better, we'll see. Uh, that one's probably not as good as the first one. Luck of the draw, and then the next one, it's about the same. So, but in any case, you can see just by eyeballing that the simulated crashes seem to fit pretty well with the observed crashes in that particular county, All right? Um, but this is not just for modeling uh, traffic accidents, although that, that's very, that's sort of the standard example for um, Poisson distributions. Um, we can also model uh, births. So what if we measure, or what if we, what if we count births every month instead of car crashes? And for this, we'll get some data from the CDC um, you can read about this on the National Vital Statistics System page that's here, wherever that is, there it is. Um, but I would say actually getting data from the CDC, it, it works much better to use um, Wonder, this, their uh, interface, and there's a link to that on this notebook. All right, so in any case, once you get the data, we can look at it. So here's our births data. And so in this case, we have data for 2016 through 2019. And for each county, we have the number of births per month. And it's not, not, it's not actually every county in the US. I think there are, uh, some counties are censored because of the small counts, and then some counties are, are combined together. But in any case, um, we have quite a few counties, 500 something, I think, uh, over these four years. All right, which is a lot of data. So to trim that down and get something more uh, workable, I'm gonna group things by county get some summary stats for the different um, counties. And then I'm gonna keep track of the ratio of the variance to the mean for each county. And then just select the, birth, the counties where the maximum number of births per month is less than 100, just to trim things down a little bit. Um, and then uh, even after doing that, just look at the counties where the variance is pretty close to the mean. All right, 
So after doing that bit of, uh, I don't know, munging, uh, here's what we get. There are 10 or 12 so counties um, for which the mean and the variance are pretty close together. Um, Blount County in Tennessee just happens coincidentally to be the one for which the mean and the variance are the closest. Uh, I was surprised to see that, but that's what happened. Um, so the Poisson model ought to fit that county's births pretty well. All right, so let's check. So we're gonna use the, the mean of 32.25 and the variance of 32.32, uh, simulate some births, and then just compare and eyeball things. And they fit pretty well. So we don't get these three outliers in here in the bottom left, but we otherwise fit pretty well. But again, this is a simulation, so if we do it again, we might get a better, um, they might look better or, or worse. So there's a second try, still looks pretty good. There's another try. Hang on. How about, there's another try. Uh, and then that time we actually got some of those outliers. So the bottom uh, histogram again is a simulation. Each simulation is gonna be different, but even with just three simulations, you can see that this Poisson model fits Blount County uh, pretty well. It does a good job, okay? And it's all because the mean and the variance there uh, are the same, or pretty close to the same. All right, so when we get to regression models next time, uh, again, there, I, I didn't want to uh, tr try to cram too much in this one session tonight, but when we get to regression next time, Poisson regression does the same thing that, that binomial uh, logistic regression does in that it takes the observations and consolidates them efficiently and gets a different random variable for each covariate class. So it fits a different distribution to each covariate class. So with Poisson regression, with simple Poisson regression, with one predictor, we're gonna get uh, a mean rate lambda for each covariate class. And that mean rate lambda is a linear combination, the log of the mean rate lambda is this a plus bx there. So the log of lambda is a linear predictor based on, um, is a linear combination of this one predictor, okay? Um, and I'm gonna go over that in detail in the next Twitch, uh, Twitch session and talk about assessment and uh, rudograms and uh, things like that. All right, but in this case, you would do something like um, for, you know, based on population, for example, or based on some sort of um, uh, categorical variable, then build your model based on that. All right, so that's where we're headed next time.